if we need still hot. All right, I want you to just listen. You don't have to turn in your Bibles to these passages, but I'm just going to read a few passages that highlight this characteristic of our God. Genesis 18, 25, Abraham asks Yahweh, Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Job 37, 23, the Almighty, we cannot find him. He is exalted in power, and he will not do violence to justice and abundant righteousness. Deuteronomy 32, 4, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice Righteous and upright is he. Proverbs seventeen fifteen. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to Yahweh. Romans 3, starting at verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the, divine, in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Our God is perfectly just. So much so that he was willing to carry out the just sentence of his wrath against all evildoers, all of those who would believe the gospel on his perfect son who did not deserve his wrath, the just sentence of his wrath. And so this morning, what, what better person is there to learn justice from than God himself to learn the principles, the application of God's justice than this perfectly upright and just God. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We are going to look at applying justice. What principles does God have for us that help us to make a just determination, a just decision or judgment when we think about various claims or various events that are happening around us. I'm going to pray and then we'll, we'll dive in. God, thank you so much for your word. It is itself a light. It provides light. It enlightens our eyes the clarity with which you have spoken is so crystal clear, God. Perhaps not always to us, but objectively, it is clear. You spoke it clearly, and you intended for our good. You intended for your glory that we would be people who individually and as a church corporately embody your justice, that the world would look in to Grace Bible Church, that the world would look in to our homes and to our places of employment, and they would see a remarkable wisdom 
a discernment that is otherworldly that we cannot produce ourselves that is just and upright. We pray that this week, as your word is is opened now and in the main service and in the weeks to come, that you would continue giving us clarity on these things, that you would strengthen our confidence in your word, that you would convict us where we must be convicted and change us where we need to be changed, God, all by your grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Last week, we spent time defining justice, uh, determining what, what justice is biblically. And we use this definition that, that justice is to grant or withhold, to reward or punish in keeping with the standards set forth by God's law. It's a judgment. You're making a, a judgment call in being just as God defines it. So if you want to practice God's standard of justice, if you want to apply biblical justice, then these are some principles this week that we're going to uh, think through that are going to aid us in doing that. And I want to just address three categories. I ended up with way more notes than than we could possibly cover this week. Um, I might put these up on online just so you can have a a, a full um, copy of, of what I would have loved to discuss today. But three categories of issues that happen to be for us front and center, racism, law enforcement, and lament. Those are the categories, racism, law enforcement, and lament. And as we work through these, we'll probably just end up touching the surface of a lot of these, but I want to just put forward claims that are being made in each of these categories. When it comes to racism, things that you're probably hearing, uh, you're probably reading online, claims that people are are making that, that they believe have to do with justice or just practices. And then I want to set out some biblical principles, so as God defines justice, uh, what has God determined, justly so, regarding these claims, things that we should take away from God's opinion on these things. Um, It's a tall task. We'll see how this goes. So racism, when it comes to racism, first claim, racism is a corporate structural sin, not necessarily an individual act or event. That's the claim that's being made. You've probably heard that. Racism is a corporate structural sin, not necessarily individual. In a wildly popular book, White Fragility, anybody heard of of that book, White Fragility? Okay, some of you are living very insulated lives. Good for you. You're probably less stressed, more at peace. Um, You don't spend a ton of time on social media. I'm proud of you guys. Uh, This book, written by a sociologist by the name of Robin DiAngelo, uh, she is a diversity trainer. This book sold over 483,000 copies in the the three or four weeks following George Floyd's death. Uh, It was written in 2018. Uh, I've seen pastors uh, locally and abroad uh, recommend this book to their congregants people who are are connected to them on social media platforms. So this is a, I have several quotes that I'm going to read from Robin DiAngelo. I don't want you to think that I'm picking the worst of the worst, some obscure, uh, easily overturned work. This is a a primary resource for uh, 
racism these days. Here's how she defines racism. When a racial group, she's white by the way. All right. When a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control, it is transformed into racism, a far-reaching system that functions independently from the intentions of self-image or individual actors. Okay, so she's the expert. It is a, a group's collective pre prejudice. It's when a group that is prejudiced has the power and institutional control to exert that power and control over other groups. That is what she is defining as racism. Uh, Christians have adopted this same idea. Jamar Tisby, uh, CEO of The Witness, which is a black Christian collective, as they call themselves. They are sort of uh, front runners in the woke movement for black Christians. He defines it in his book, Fighting How to Fight Racism. Racism is a system of oppression based on race. So this idea of sy systemic oppression is essential to how racism is being defined. Again, Robin DiAngelo, uh, if racism is a system, then you can see how easily you can become complicit in the practice of racism, not based on any individual merit or demerit of your own, but just by virtue of operating within whatever they call a racist system. If you go to work and the company is deemed racist or one of the racist institutions, then by virtue of going there and being a part of the majority culture, then you, based on their definition, become complicit. Uh, which then leads to people being unintentionally so white supremacists. Here's how she defines white supremacy. White supremacy is a descriptive and useful term to capture the all-encompassing centrality and assumed superiority of people defined and perceived as white and the practices based on this assumption. White supremacy in this context does not refer to individual white people and their individual intentions or actions, but to an overarching political, economic, and social system of domination. That's white supremacy. So if you are white and a part of these systems, even though you may not be a white supremacist, you've probably never met someone who is a white supremacist, but by virtue of them defining racism as a systemic reality, not based on individual merits, then you automatically become racist or a white supremacist, etc. What does God have to say about this kind of thinking? <laughs> go, go back to Psalm 19. We've looked at Psalm 19 uh, each week a little bit. We started here discussing the clarity and sufficiency of Scripture, but particularly helpful to understanding this claim is Psalm 19, verse 9b. So 9 says that the fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. That was the, the statement about uh, the purity or clarity of God's word. And it's enduring forever. Then David makes the statement, the judgments of Yahweh are true 
They are righteous altogether. One principle to take away from this is that God, not man, is the one who defines sin. So that's uh, the, the first principle in response to this claim in your outline. You have them all up there for you. We'll, we'll work through uh, several of these. Man doesn't define what racism is. God defines what racism is. Okay? Pertinent from this passage is the judgments. That's our, our Hebrew word, primary Hebrew word for justice or a judgment, mishpat, that we discussed last week. God's mishpats, plural, are true. His judgments are true. When God makes a determination, a judgment, a decision about what is sin, that wins the day. It is true. They are righteous altogether. Next principle in response to this claim, racism is actually more properly defined as hatred or partiality. Hatred or partiality, why is that important? The reason that is important is because that can be practiced by individuals and then expanded to a corporate or institutional level. This is practiced by individuals. In James chapter 2, this was something that James's audience was practicing, and James brings a corrective, and he calls it favoritism, if you're reading your NASB, verse 1 in James chapter 2. He says, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And then he describes the particular manifestation that was taking place where his audience was. And then in verse 9, he refers to it as partiality. If you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. The particular manifestation uh, for this audience was not on the basis of ethnicity, but wealth. Wealthy people get a better seat. We treat them better. Poorer people get a worse seat, and we treat them worse. That's partiality. This can take a variety of forms. It could be based on social class, based on reputation, or a a whole host of things, including ethnicity. Racism, as we call it, even though there is only one race, the human race, there aren't various races of people, but ethnicity is really just a social construct, uh, or race is a social construct. Ethnicity is a real thing. There are various ethnicities, nationalities, tribes, languages. But ethnic partiality, if you will, racism, is the practice of despising, belittling, hating, or mistreating others on the basis of ethnicity. And it's really simple. You, nobody, I don't think, here is confused about that. That's real racism. This can be practiced, as I said, by individuals or by collective groups. Uh, This is evident in America's own history. Racist individuals constructed racist ideologies about a superior race and people from Africa being descended from something less than human, and so they had a justification for enslaving them. That's an example of a systemic sin, systemic injustice, but it's carried out by racist individuals. The system itself is not ultimately responsible, but it's the individuals perpetuating the sinful practices, and that's our next principle. Unjust people, not systems, are responsible for systemic injustice. 
it's so helpful that Jesus actually plays this out for us when he addresses systemic sin in his day. Jesus, there were systemic sins in Jesus' day. Sins that had been commonly practiced among the Jews. It was, they had the stamp of, a, of approval from the law as they misinterpreted it. But what does Jesus do when he addresses the sin, the systemic sin, the real systemic sin, in his day? Luke 20, verse 45. And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. And then the, one of the, the examples of injustice in verse 47, this is Luke 20, 47, devouring widows' houses was a practice of the, of the religious leadership. Verse tw- uh, 1 in chapter 21 he picks up with and sees an example of the very thing that he's condemning. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. The religious leadership, what Jesus is highlighting for his disciples, as he warns them about the scribes, is that this woman who, as the law was handed down to Moses from God, and we read last week, Widows were a helpless, defenseless, unprovided for a class of people in the nation. And they were supposed to be provided for. It was just. There was provision for the needy under Mosaic law. And here she is, not being provided for, but adding to the greed of the religious leadership to give the last of what she has to live on and then go home and die. That was unjust. Jesus doesn't blame, you'll notice, a vague, abstract, nameless, faceless system, but he actually names the perpetrators of this system. Verse 45 in chapter 20, Beware, not of the system, of the scribes. They are your perpetrators. They're the guilty party. And he doesn't appeal to some abstract, undefined standard of injustice or even the history of what's happening, of what had happened in the nation. We'll get to that. But he says the very practice that is unjust. They're devouring widows' houses. That's clear. And you couldn't hear Jesus and walk away thinking, man, maybe, maybe I'm practicing some injustice and I just don't see it yet. No, if you're devouring widows' houses, then he's talking about you. That's very different than what we're hearing in our day. You could hear someone wax eloquent about all of the ways the system in America perpetuates racism and leave more confused than you were at the beginning of the conversation. There's nothing concrete. There's vague references to the man or whomever. That's the problem. And you you really leave with less clarity than you had at the beginning. And I don't, I don't think the problem is with 
the communication abilities of people saying these things. They're articulate. They're oftentimes smart, intelligent men, but they're grasping for something that's actually not true. And so contrast that with the clarity of God's word. It's all true, it's all righteous, and it brings clarity. If what you were saying was true and righteous, moreover, if it was biblical, it would be bringing clarity. You leave with less clarity because you're hearing something that's false. Next claim. Claim B. White people practice and perpetuate racism without realizing it. Well, that's about as charitable as you can get if you're going to accuse someone of being a racist, is that you don't realize you're doing this. The recent Together for the Gospel conference, Jonathan Lehman uh, argued this very point. He's the editorial director for Nine Marks. He argued that we are so thoroughly sinful that we will naturally align ourselves with other people and groups to give ourselves, not ourselves, white majority culture, an advantage over others. Um, he says, we will naturally make choices that privilege us to the detriment of other people, referring again to, to white people. And he even appealed to texts like Psalm 51.5, Isaiah 64.6, Jeremiah 17.9. We're born so thoroughly sinful. And if you're familiar with these passages, you love these passages. Born in sin, conceived in iniquity, uh, in and of ourselves, our righteous deeds are filthy rags. And the heart is so desperately wicked, sinfully sick, who can know it? Well, if that's true, which is what he appeals to to say, we're perpetuating racist, racism without realizing it. If that's true, though, if, if, if the problem is in the human heart, then is that not also true of minorities? If, it's, if the problem is the human heart, then it can't just be white people with the problem, that must then mean, based on that argument, that minorities are also making choices that privilege themselves and privilege their ethnic group. What does God tell us to think about this kind of argumentation, that we can actually perpetuate and practice sin without realizing it? If you're still in Psalm 19, this is still a good passage to answer this question. If we were to keep reading, David says in verse 12, wow, who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep your, back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. So even after David has all of these great grand things to say about God's word, wow, he admits there are errors that have yet to be discerned by me. That's interesting. As clear as God's word is, David writes words inspired by the Holy Spirit. He has not discerned all of his sin. He calls certain faults hidden. So they're beyond what he realizes. Does this mean then that someone can be racist without realizing it? If even David recognized that he was so thoroughly sinful that his heart is desperately sick, I mean, aren't we all capable of being complicit in sins that we're unaware of at a given moment? Actually, yeah, it is. That's possible. <laughs> that's possible. But if that's the case, what needs to be done about this unknown sin of ours? We need to be shown it, right? If you are, in fact, practicing some sin that you're unaware of, then it 
ought to be, it can be shown to you with the very things by the very standard that David articulated a few verses prior. What would be a useful tool to enlighten someone's eyes to sin that it remains hidden to them, to alter their soul if that's what's necessary, to make them who maybe they're just simple, to make them wise regarding a specific hidden sin of theirs. God's word. God's word is perfect for doing this. So even hidden sins must be defined and identified biblically. Someone who was convinced that you were not seeing the racism that, w- that they could see so clearly would not turn to sociological constructs, terminology, the authority of American history to help you see those things. God's word is perfect for that. And so if someone is accusing you or says, you know, you're actually complicit, you just don't realize it, you should say, oh, I'm so glad that you're, you're clear on this. Would you open God's word with me, please, and help me to see my sin? God defines those things, and his word is the perfect means of, of clarifying what needs to be clarified in our lives. This naturally leads us to our next claim <laughs> as we think about what's helpful to the Christian regarding racism, claim C, secular ideologies are helpful analytical tools for Christians. The two, as far as I can tell, two foremost racial ideologies being used currently in this way, being called helpful analytical tools, are identity politics and critical race theory. We could do a, a whole lesson on these, brief de- definition. Um, identity politics is really the practice of appealing to one group or various groups on the basis of their being victimized or treated unjustly for the sake of some political advancement. So a politician says, hey, I can serve your group. Over, I'll fight against this other group that's been oppressing you, vote for me. The book, White Fragility, that many pastors are recommending, in D'Angelo's own words, this is before she gets out of the introduction, says this book is unapologetically rooted in identity politics. Uh, She says that identity politics refers to the focus on the barriers specific groups face in their struggle for equality. She's missing the, what identity politics actually is, actually does. And she says, we have yet to achieve our founding principle in equality for all, but any gains we have made thus far have been through identity politics. So she sees this as the solution to the societal ills in America. And this is what churches and Christians are latching onto, and it's no wonder there's division in so many churches. This is why the ideology comes embedded with it, uh, divisiveness. And again, even at, at major Christian conferences, this is being taught that identity politics is an unexpected ally for Christians, because it... It's supposed to help us read our Bibles better, is the claim. Uh, critical race theory is a, is a similar popular idea. This ideology asserts that socio, uh, societal structures and cultural assumptions regarding race, they are the primary cause for so- social ills in America. So you find 
whatever's wrong with America, a part of that problem, a, a primary part of the problem, is going to have something to do with race and the inequalities that have to do with race. The, uh, an entire denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, actually adopted critical race theory as uh, a helpful ideological framework. Um, critical race theory and inter intersectionality should, be, should only be employed as analytical tools subordinate to scripture, not as transcendent ideological frameworks. That was a resolution that they adopted in 2019, not realizing that it's, it's actually, uh, it can't be subordinate to scripture if it's used at all. It's a competing ideology. Couple problems with this, uh, some takeaway principles to think justly uh, about these things. And you've heard this before, uh, John even touched on some of this in his last equipping hour. Two principles to take away, secular ideologies cannot aid biblical interpretation. Secular ideologies cannot aid biblical interpretation and believing scripture actually precedes understanding our understanding about our experiences. This is why secular ideas can't help you understand what God has said. They're, they're competing. It's sort of like saying unbelief aids faith. No, it, it, it destroys faith. It, it competes with faith. And you have never believed and disbelieved God ever at the same time in the same moment. Romans 8, 7 tells us that the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it, it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not able to do so. So ideas, principles that come from unbelieving minds are hostile toward God's wisdom. And by the way, you don't have it on, the, uh, on what's up on the PowerPoint, but there's a, a list of passages online on the handouts that go with each of these principles if you want to study these things further. The claim that's being made about these ideas is that they don't get everything wrong. They, there's truth in all of them to some degree, except they either, they, they, they just don't go far enough. They're missing a piece of the biblical pie. Now, that's interesting because if they're not saying what God is saying, then they're false. And if some portion of them is saying what God has already said, then they're unnecessary. So why do we need them? <laughs> we don't need them. We have God's sufficient word. You can write down Hebrews 11.3, where the author there says, by faith we know that the world, worlds were created by what is not seen. Um, by faith we know something. Well, that means faith precedes understanding. You have to believe God's word first, to understand the world. So to determine that some ideolo ideology is actually helpful and gets the world right, you would have already had to understand what God's word said, says about that aspect of life, if that makes sense. Okay, next, next claim. America's racist history provides sufficient criteria to explain racism in America currently. We'll, we'll just touch on this briefly, but essentially the claim is 
to explain the current state of things in America, how thoroughly racist they are, what you will notice if, as you hear these arguments being made is a lot of discussion about the past. I'm gonna tell you how racist America is and then I'm gonna, with a, a subtle sleight of hand, talk about what has been. Uh, things like slavery or incarceration practices after the Emancipation Proclamation or a practice like redlining, which was an unjust uh, practice by banks who would literally draw a red line around a certain segments of a city and they wouldn't give loans to people of color in those neighborhoods to keep the area white. That was unjust, it was outlawed. But appeals to past practices, even in the church where they were, blacks weren't permitted to full membership or uh, weren't, there were segregated congregations, things like that, those were all unjust. The, the assumption there is that history provides sufficient evidence for the current state of things. And just a, a few simple ways to think about this biblically, it just, it doesn't even pass the, some basic biblical texts like Genesis 3. Um, there was nothing in, in Genesis 3, the moment Adam and Eve sinned, there was nothing in their past, though it was brief, to explain their current sinful state. The principle there just being history doesn't always hold sufficient answers for, for the present. The, the answers for why things are the way they are, not always can that be found historically. Your own conversion makes no sense based on your past, per Ephesians 2. You were dead in sin and transgressions. There was nothing in your past that made you prone to believing the gospel and being converted. So the moment you were converted, it lacked sufficient explanation in your past for why you actually believe the gospel in a given moment. Uh, you can think also of Israel. They actually had faithful Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs. They were men of faith. Why didn't Israel believe? That's not a, they don't have sufficient explanation for their unbelief in their past national history. And then you think about future Israel, what will be future history? One day, all Israel will believe at a given point in time. And then at that moment in history, there will not be sufficient proof from their national past history to explain why they finally believe. That is all based on the promises of God that are irrevocable. So as you, if you're hearing those conversations, as you're listening to arguments, be, just be aware that appeals to the past are often uh, really a sleight of hand. Not that they don't have any impact. We understand those things. Uh, history can have an impact on the present, but it's not, it doesn't oftentimes provide a sufficient explanation for the current state of things. All right, law enforcement. Second point on your outline. Just some, some simple th ways to be thinking about law enforcement, and there have been highly publicized instances of blacks, particularly unarmed blacks, who have been killed by someone who's not black. And those have been leveraged by the media to, uh, to tell a certain story, to portray a certain narrative as uh, one popular celebrity said that uh, black men are being hunted down in the streets, that you, you get this picture that it's dangerous for black men to even walk out of their doors during, during the day. 
It's kind of the, the picture that we've been led to believe. A few events, Trayvon Martin, which started the Black Lives Matter movement in 2012, his death, Mike Brown and the Ferguson incident in 2014, Breonna Taylor more recently, that was March of last year, and then perhaps most famously George Floyd in May of last year. All of these are, are not without their, their personal merits, each, each individual instance, which is how God determined justice to be uh, sought after, based on the merits of an individual case. We, we won't be able to go through all of these, but in the death of Trayvon Martin, one principle that is helpful to take away uh, from that is in some cases, the truth that is necessary for earthly justice just isn't knowable. And that's hard. <laughs> that's hard to accept. When all the facts you would like to have at your disposal just can't be. And particularly with Trayvon, that, that's interesting because there's a George Zimmerman, who ended up somehow in a scuffle with Trayvon Martin while he was patrolling his neighborhood that had had multiple break-ins. Uh, there's a gap in the story that's unaccounted for. He hangs up with the dispatcher and pursues Trayvon. After the fact, there's evidence of a scuffle and all you have is George Zimmerman's word against no one. Maybe it was murder in the second degree. Uh, we don't know. We don't have all the facts. Proverbs 29, 26 says that many seek the face of a ruler, but it is from Yahweh that a man gets justice. That's got to be where we have our hope. And when all the facts can't be known and there may still be an injustice that is done, we, we can rest knowing that God will have his day and every sin will be punished at the end, either on Jesus on the cross or for the individual who committed it for eternity. Ferguson was an interesting event, event B, because the story that was told from Ferguson was this was a black man who was gunned down by a white police officer in cold blood. This is where hands up, don't shoot originated. That his hands were up and he was shot in cold blood by a brutal officer who had the power to do so. Witnesses corroborated this story. Uh, even Mike Brown's friend who was with him, Dorian Johnson, said this is exactly what happened. This police officer gunned my friend down. And other witnesses claimed to have heard and seen what happened. All of this take place. Compared to the officer's story, which was much more in keeping with reality, after several rounds of forensics, was done on Mike Brown's body. Even a, a follow-up investigation at the request of President Obama uh, of the Department of Justice to look into it and the Ferguson Police Department more generally. Turns out that Mike Brown, a, an 18-year-old who was 6'4", 292 pounds, and had just committed a, a strong-arm robbery uh, minutes earlier, to which Officer Wilson was responding, had actually reached into the officer's car to take his gun. His DNA and blood were found in the car and, and on the doors. And when that didn't 
succeed. The gun was fired twice. Mike Brown uh, attempted to get away. Officer pursued. And far from his hands being up, entrance and exit wounds demonstrated that they, the entrance wounds were on the top of his arms and exit, exit wounds on the outside. So the, the entire story, after months of unrest, there were riots, uh, protests, people were burning stuff. Poor Ferguson. The principles that were of justice, of God's justice, that are particularly helpful, uh, would have been helpful if employed in this instance, were to not render a judgment until the facts were available. Don't render a verdict based on insufficient evidence. Render just judgments once the facts are in. And then truth is not determined by majority vote. There were Christians who were saying the opposite of all of these things. We've waited long enough. This keeps happening. This is racism. It's clear. It, it, was, it was the exact opposite. And so simple principles like what's found in Proverbs 18, 13, and verse 17. One seems right until another comes and examines him. Or he who answers before he hears, it is a folly and a shame to him. Wait. Wait. The, uh, the last two, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, uh, really tragic deaths. Not popular uh, to, to say, but it's certainly pertinent when it comes to God's justice, is that as these individuals were involved in a life of crime, in Breonna Taylor's uh, case, uh, she was caught in crossfire between her boyfriend shooting at the police and the police shooting back. And she ended up dead in her own apartment. Um, but she was aiding her boyfriend in uh, selling drugs. And the police, the, the police were, uh, had been watching them for some months uh, before they finally uh, sought to apprehend them. Uh, there's a lesson in that from Proverbs 24, verses 21 to 22. Fear Yahweh and the king and don't join with those who do otherwise. Who knows what disaster will come upon them suddenly. Uh, and in George Floyd's instance, uh, he's really been held up as a martyr of the woke movement. A brutal officer, Derek Chauvin, had his ne uh, knee on his neck for over eight minutes and Though that wasn't the only contributing factor to George Floyd's death, it was what killed him, the, the primary contributing factor. Um, and in this instance, um, you shouldn't watch the, the videos. I, I'm not encouraging that. But in the videos, it's, it's clear that the several officers who were detaining George Floyd for passing a, a fake $20 bill moments earlier before they detained him. He was a career criminal, a violent man, constantly in and out of trouble with the law. And unfortunately, this, this was his end. Proverbs 1, children, says a lot about this. Trouble follows those who make foolish decisions and associate with lawless individuals and seek unjust gain. And although the, the, what eventually ended up being the punishment was not fitting for the crime for George Floyd, uh, this is, biblically speaking, somewhat inescapable when you live this kind of life. Deuteronomy 25, verse 3, by the way, proves that guilt is not grounds for excessive punishment. That's helpful. Even the guilty were not to be treated however the judge or the, those carrying out justice 
tasked with, with carrying out justice felt like treating them in the moment. There was a limit to the punishment that could be put on them, and wisely so, because even those tasked with carrying out justice, like police officers, are also sinful human beings. You can put the, the last point up as we, as we wrap up. Lament. This is something that I've heard quite a bit about, is that as minorities have grieved over the racial injustices, which, by the way, if you even recount the, the four instances that we just mentioned, and there are others, racism was, was not demo, a demonstrable feature in any of them. That wasn't the issue, although what they had in common is that they were black. The claim by many believers is that we need to join our minority brothers and sisters in lamenting with them, right? Weep with those who weep. That's a biblical principle. It's a, an excellent biblical principle. As we know, we've practiced this. Two things to highlight. Proper grief requires knowledge. Proper grief requires knowledge. Proverbs 19.2 says, desire without knowledge is not good. And whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. You go run to go grieve with somebody and you don't know what's going on and you don't ask any questions and you will miss your way. You will miss God's intended goal in you grieving with that person. And uh, what I think is, is, is also helpful to remember is that sorrow and suffering do not exempt us if we're the ones in lamenting, in lament, that does not exempt us from instruction, correction, or even rebuke. Some examples. Job, Job 32 to 37, his wise friend Elihu actually rebukes Job for speaking wick wickedly in the midst of his suffering. And God doesn't rebuke Elihu for rebuking Job. That was right. Uh, Rachel needed to be instructed when she didn't have kids. Her husband reminded her that that was God's doing. Jacob needed his sons to, to gently come alongside him and say, Dad, you're not thinking clearly about this. We have to bring Benjamin back to Egypt or we're not getting fed. Aaron was told not to grieve for, for the particular sin of his sons and their death. David needed Joab to talk sense into him or he would, was going to lose the kingdom. Jesus rebukes the disciples on the road to Emmaus for not believing because the reason they're grieved is due to unbelief. And the Thessalonian church, they were grieving. They weren't rebuked. They weren't even corrected. They were just missing information. And so they were gently instructed how to comfort one another in the midst of their grief. So there's all kinds of instruction and help that we can bring to those who are grieving. That does not, for us to grieve, that doesn't require uh, agreement with every complaint being made. Uh, and in some instances, grief may not be the right response. That just takes biblical discernment and wisdom uh, and, and gentleness, compassion, and patience as 1 Thessalonians 5.14 mentions. All right, we are over time. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for your word again. Help us to embody these principles and, and more. Give us wisdom as we seek to navigate these things for your glory and the good of your church. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, see you in the main service.